Dr. Samir Eldayev is a surgeon living in Pennsylvania. About 13 years ago, he began returning to his native Egypt to give patients access to specialized medical care and to train the next generation of doctors. Samir loved returning to his roots and making a difference, but the demands of travel were unsustainable. Back in Pennsylvania, he wanted to help from afar, but didn't know where to turn. In the 1950s, the British Royal Society noticed a big problem. Scientists and doctors were leaving England for the United States. They were alarmed and coined the term brain drain. What was top of mind 70 years ago is now very critical for governments around the world. What was true in Britain is now true globally. Countries are losing up to 30% of their populations to brain drain. In the last few years, over 230 million people have left their homes in search of stability or opportunity. We haven't seen migration levels like this since World War II, and with transportation becoming cheaper and more accessible, this trend is only going to grow. I can relate. I was born and raised in Montreal, and when Canada faced a recession, I didn't want to be yet another young person stuck working a minimum wage job. And so I packed up my life and moved south. I've been living in the United States ever since. In the past, if you wanted to give back to your community of origin from your new home, there were only a handful of ways that you could do so. You could visit or volunteer like Dr. Samir, you could invest, you could buy nostalgia goods like olive oil, or in my case, maple syrup, or you could send remittances home. But all of these required either time, money, or a lot of logistics, and the barriers for ordinary people who wanted to give back on a sustained basis were simply too high. In today's economy, countries need every skilled professional that they can find. That's why places like China make a concerted effort to keep in touch with their professors and researchers abroad and to celebrate and incentivize returnees. It doesn't work out that way if you're a small country. If you're China, that works well. But if you're a country like Kosovo, a number of years ago, a fund was set up to try to lure key researchers back to teach students in Pristina. Unfortunately, no one applies. Professors simply didn't want to give up their lucrative or prestigious opportunities. Again, the barrier to going back if you're living abroad was simply too high. But today we're in an age where if you live in a stable environment and you've got a reliable internet connect, uh, connection, then where you live is much less important than what you know and who you know. So there's got to be a better way to harness diaspora expertise in this connected age. And in fact, studies show that immigrants or diasporas or expats, whatever term you'd want to use, want to give back to their communities of origin from their new homes. In fact, there was a World Bank study about a year ago that found that over 87% of professionals from the Middle East and North Africa, or Eurasia, as um, uh, Parag asked us to say, agreed with this statement, I am willing to invest time in mentoring individuals back in my country of origin. The same study found that individuals were more likely to give of their expertise than of their money, and in fact wanted to do so. Let's think about that for a second. The global monetary remittance economy today accounts for over $600 billion. Just imagine if we unleash the knowledge remittance economy at scale. If people are already giving back more in terms of ideas and expertise than money, think of what that can look like in the future. According to the World Economic Forum, over 65% of kids today are going to work at jobs that haven't been invented yet. 
Now, we can't train people for jobs that don't yet exist, but we can future-proof them by connecting them to people working in industries at the vanguard of change, like edtech, fintech, medtech, AI, robotics, and more. That's why schools like Stanford are no longer offering career counseling. They're building what they're calling career community, because they want their students to be in touch with people several steps ahead of them who can identify gaps, opportunities, roles, and even give them access to jobs. Now, for Stanford and other brand name schools, they turn to their alumni to serve this purpose. But what if, for the rest of the world, we use diasporas as that career community. The relationship between an alumni to their alma mater is emotional. It's about a caring community. Diasporas also exhibit that care and concern for the communities that le they left behind. Maybe not everyone, but many. Now, Efforts have already been made to try to connect diaspora communities to their home countries, but they've been made on a country-by-country -country basis. This is an economy of scale problem, even though countries like India or Moldova or Jordan are vastly different. The challenges they face in this regard are the same. And so by dealing, it, by dealing with it on a country-by-country -country basis, you're in silos, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and you're missing out on opportunities. So for example, Fortune 500 companies are very diverse. They have multiple diasporas in their midst. Groups like Arabs at Spotify or Indians at Salesforce. If you take a holistic approach, you can engage those companies as well because they see it as an opportunity for their employees to get involved. We know that knowledge is now flowing in every direction. So whereas before, if you engaged a diaspora in giving back to their home community, it was often because they felt good, they felt connected to their roots. But now there are actually self-interested reasons why they would do this professionally. It gives you access to new markets, new insights, a pipeline to talent, and frankly, exposure to new solutions. A Gallup poll in the United States recently found that in every industry, companies are expanding their distributed workforces. What that means is gone are the days of people being concentrated in headquarters and working in one spot. That means there's an opportunity to identify, hire, and retain employees no matter where they live. That's an opportunity for diasporas to serve as cultural ambassadors and to be a liaison between employees and employers. For the last couple of years, I've been working with people whose hearts are in two places. Here's some examples. Dara is a data scientist at Spotify. Mohammed Shadi is at Dell. And Iyad Yaqub, who used to work with Yamama here, um, was in Syria and then Stanford working on career services. These individuals want to give back from their new homes. They don't want to be paid. Frankly, most of them don't need it. But they do want their time to be used wisely. They want to make a difference. They want to stay connected to their roots, especially if they have children. For these and other reasons, my team set up a company called Localized. Localized helps colleges prepare students for the future. On our platform, students access career guidance, role models, and expertise from global professionals who share language, culture, and roots. Think Slack meets Quora for career readiness in emerging markets, drawing on diaspora and local expertise. Our dream is to turn brain drain to brain gain at scale. So how does it work? On localized, experts create channels to talk about future trends and best practices in their industries, and students join as many of these channels as they want to learn about these fields and to have their questions answered. These are some examples of real channels on localized. Our mentors are incredible and busy. That's why localized is a one-to-many model, because they don't have time to mentor one student after another, but they would love to help level the playing field for 50 or 100 students from their communities of origin. The platform is live in Arabic and English. We launched in beta in Jordan, and we're expanding across the MENA region this year. Next year, we're expanding to India and ultimately Latin America. And as we grow, we're bringing on companies, as I mentioned, who see this as a potential pipeline for talent 
in emerging markets, meaning we don't want to exasper exacerbate brain drain, we want to help to ease that flow. I don't want to pick on Kosovo, but I do think it's important to mention that they initiated a diaspora registry a couple of years ago. They wanted to keep in touch with their diasporas, and other governments are looking at it as a model. Now, over a quarter of a million people signed up, which is great, but they only asked three questions. They asked people for their names, their occupations, and their addresses. That's the old paradigm. In today's world, more important information is what are your passions, what's your expertise, and what's your availability to give back. In the knowledge economy, what you can give and what you know is more important than where you live. This is Najib, some of you may know him. Najib Jarrar is the head of consumer marketing at Google in Dubai. And Najib credits his career path to a one hour presentation that was given by a Microsoft employee when he was a student. Seeing a fellow Jordanian work at a company like Microsoft changed his life and made him realize that he could pursue his own dreams. Najib is now a mentor on Localize and he's energized to give back to the next generation. We want students everywhere to have access to the same inspiration and role models and frankly career community that Najib had and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you so much.